Hi, everybody, and welcome to the Pre-Accident Podcast. I am your host for today's episode of the Pre-Accident Podcast. You can call me Todd, but my real friends call me the man who met Scott Geller in front of 6,000 people in Denver, the Mile High City, and had a argument, no, not an argument, what would it be? a discussion, a discussion around the uh, longevity of BBS versus the new view of safety. If you were there, thank you. It was really fun. I had a great time. You don't know this, but in the back, huge buffet table full of sandwich meats. Yeah, and brownies. And it was Denver, so I think the brownies had marijuana. I don't know. I, I kind of, my fantasy was that the brownies had marijuana. They might not have. But I think it would have made for a much different conference had the brownies had marijuana in them. That's just I'm just I'm I'm just shooting in the dark here. So today's a good podcast. I think you're going to like it. It's a little conversation with my buddy and yours, Daniel Hummerdahl, and we talk about the art of work. And um, it's interesting because the conversation was held in the Sky City Tower in Auck- Auckland. I can't even say it. Auckland, New Zealand. Which sounds braggy, but uh, we both were there for a big conference. And Daniel spoke. I spoke the first day, and Daniel spoke the second day. So I guess I was the keynote, and Dan was the secondary keynote. I, I think that's uh, that's probably a good way to look at it. And then we did some workshops, and we hung out. But what we were walking around talking, because I don't get to see him very often. And uh, he said, have you ever been up this tower thing? And I said, you know, I don't normally do that. And he turned to me, and he said, sometimes you have to do the tourist things in a town and I thought well he's kind of throwing down on me so we did it and while we were up there there was a little cafe you know kind of a road you know this tower if you live in uh, any place Seattle has one and Toronto has one and Calgary has one there's lots of them all over the world there's a little cafe and a gift shop up there and so we sat down and had about the most expensive coffee my money could buy and uh and recorded a little podcast and that is, in fact, what you're going to listen to is the conversation Daniel and I had around his his organization, which is called The Art of Work. And uh, I think you'll like it. So other than that, um, let's see. I do have a story to decide. So, you know, I always have these uh, adventures. And uh, this one's a little – I don't know how to tell it. But so I was on – This is. it's going to sound snotty no matter how I tell it. So I, I was on a plane coming home. And I was exhausted. It had been a long week, and the flight was late. And uh, and all flights are kind. They're they're always late. It seems like, and they're they're. It wasn't super late, but it was like late enough to make you crazy late. So I've decided my rule is: if it's only thirty minutes late, you can't really be angry. I mean, you you should be probably. But and this was we're probably like an hour late, so it's past my thirty minute rule. I sit down. Um, I'd gotten upgraded. This is the part that's creepy. So I'm sitting up. I'm, I'm sitting on the last row of first class, and there's probably one, two, three, four, five rows of first class. So there must be, there must be twenty people in first class. And of course, the, every plane because now everybody uses data analytics um, to fill all their planes. So I don't know if you notice this, but every plane's full all the time, which is probably good for business, but it sucks if you're on the plane. So I'm sitting on the back row of first class. And uh, and they bring this little basket of treats around, and uh, and they bring it. Uh, the first time it comes out, I see it coming down the aisle, and it gets to about the third, maybe the fourth row, third row, probably really close to me, but not to me. Then the second time, the so the the flight attendant lady takes it back up, and she refills it, and she brings it back down, but she starts on the first row again. And comes all the way down, and this time gets all the way to the fifth row, but goes to the side I'm not on, and then goes back up front and refills it. And then she comes back, and she starts on the first row again, and so everybody gets a chance to dig through it. And then finally it comes to me, and I said, don't. When when you bring the basket out the second time, you should bring it to where you stopped 
so that the people where you stopped have the opportunity to pick up so everybody gets the basket first and then everybody can have the basket second. You see how lame this sounds terrible. I'm, I feel so embarrassed to be telling you this story, but I got to tell you the story. So, so the lady said, well, uh, that's how I do it. And I said, well, here's a better way to do it. And uh, she said, but, but I'm nice. I was being polite. And I said, oh, no, you're, you're, it's not that you're not polite. It's that it's about social fairness and equity. And it's about the perception of fairness. So I get into this conversation. Well, I opened up Pandora's box. And so now she wants to tell me that she's really a socially fair person. And I feel like I was like, why did I say anything? I should have shut my mouth. But she's having a long explanation. And I do something. I'm just I'm kind of embarrassed to say I'm horrified to say I did it. But I basically said, that's okay. I'm done having this conversation. Boom. What a creepy, 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 creepy thing to say. I mean, it's creepy for a million reasons. It's super creepy because I'm in front row. It's snotty. It, it's classist. It's, it's just, I'm embarrassed. And after I said it, she turned around and walked up to the front, and I just felt like hammered crap. I was just like, how, how mean can you be? And I'm feeling terrible. And about two minutes later, she comes back, and she said, can I talk to you? And I said, I, I, I really, I, I, am, I am so, and then she turned her head. And there was a tear running down her cheek. And she was probably, I don't know, she wasn't, she, she'd she been a flight attendant for, uh, she had a lot of experience. She'd been a flight attendant for a while. And she was crying and she said, I want to talk to you, but it's not about what we were talking about. And I said, what is it? And she said, do I smell? And I said, what do you mean, do you smell? And she said, do I smell? And I said, no. Now, normally, you guys, if you'd have said that to me, I'd have made a joke because it's kind of open for jokes and it cuts the tension and it's kind of a way to have that conversation and not take it to some weird level. But because I, I knew she was crying, I knew the question was serious. And I said, what on earth would make you say that? And she said, the man up front told me that I stinked and asked me to leave. And then she said, I've been a flight attendant for 26 years, and I've never had anyone say that to me. And she says, I care very much about how I look and how I smell. And I said, my goodness, no, you you don't smell at all. And I said, this isn't your problem. The the problem is the man up front. Which one was it? And she wouldn't tell me. (laughs) And quite honestly, between us, we're friends. Probably that was a good thing to not tell me. Uh, because I'm pretty certain at that moment I would have probably gone up and talked to the guy, uh, but she wouldn't tell me. And, and I know I would have gone up and talked to her because I'm pretty sure the flight attendants would have supported me. It, it probably wouldn't have been on the news. Uh, well, maybe. I don't know. Who knows? Maybe Maybe her not telling me was a good idea. And I turned around and I said, you know, this isn't your problem. This is that person's problem. And I want you to know that that – your concern matters, but don't worry because you don't smell and you're a very, very good person. And I'm so glad you asked me because I want to be the one to tell you that you don't smell. And she thanked me and she walked away. And then when I got off the plane, I was coming out. Cause remember I was on the last row of first class. I hugged her on the way out and I walked down the jetway and I drove home. And kind of, kind of the universe schooled me a little bit there, because you know I was a little bit of a jerk. I mean, I was, I mean, in comparison to somebody saying you stink, I'm probably not even on the jerk scale. But you know, I started thinking about that, and I started thinking about the fact that when we interface with people at all levels, it's so important to remember that we're all people at all levels, and that my little basket fairness lesson, which I wasn't really mad about, but for some reason it was like I wanted to talk about. You know, it wouldn't it be so much fairer a feeling if you started where you left off. For some reason, that story kind of became less interesting. And I felt terrible, but I also felt like I was able to help her understand. And I, and I think because we had that encounter, she felt safe to ask me that question. I mean, I, get, I guess that's why. But she didn't smell. I mean, she didn't smell. And, and quite honestly... How dare you, man, in second or first row of first class on the United flight from Denver to Albuquerque? How dare you? 
tell somebody they smell. I don't know who you are, but you know what? Um, I, I'd be really, really uh, forthright and honest with you. Not aggressive and mean, but forthright and honest. And I probably would use a naughty word. I kind of feel a naughty. I felt a naughty word on, you know, when she told me. So that's my story of my airline event that's most recent. That one's probably, it's a horrible story, but it was probably a really good story for me to have happen because it really did kind of refocus me back around to sort of the reason we're here. And the reason we're here is to not value judge and stratify by class. The reason we're here is to get along and to love one another and to understand and appreciate the fact that expertise lives at every single level of our organization. No matter who the worker is or whatever they do, expertise lives at every single level of that organization. So let's talk to Daniel, because uh, I think you'll find this conversation pretty cool. He's a cool cat, no doubt about it, and he's got a bunch going on. So uh, let, let me take you, if I can, through the magic of electronic, uh, whatever this is called, uh, podcastiness. To the top of the Sky City Tower in Auckland, New Zealand, and a conversation with Daniel Hummerdahl. Tell me about Art of Work, because really, I'm I'm super interested in what you guys are doing to sort of take this positive message out to the world. Just kind of walk me through it, like like I don't know anything about it. Tell me what's up. Okay, so. Art of Work uh, started, we started up this business about a year and a half ago, and it was a, a group of people who'd been sort of working with safety differently ideas, safety two ideas, uh, for the last five years, um, mostly in Australia, but they've been working in operationalizing those concepts into practices, and we thought that there's so much attention, there's enough traction with the ideas across a lot of organizations. What's missing now is to someone who can help those organizations to take the steps. There might be, you know, we have champions in different organizations really believe in the safety different ideas, but we're looking for someone to, you know, help them do the transformation. So that was the, the purpose of our work, to help organizations transform from a compliance and control paradigm to safety being about building capacity. So why that name? It's 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 almost purposefully non-technical. I mean, for God's sakes, it has the word art in it. Yeah, no, the, um, if you go back and you look at what has been done around work, and you, you will always end up uh, looking into the work of Frederick Taylor, which was the science of work, um, which was about managers uh, defining the best way and then enforcing the adaptation or adoption of those principles by the workers. And that whole science approach um, of top-down produce a lot of problematic side effects. So art of work is about being creative, about unleashing the potential for new ideas, for innovation, for capacity from within rather than imposing solutions onto organizations. So we have to we want to be very artful in the way we do that in the unexpected. You don't know what's going to happen when you start this transformation either. So it's a creative process. It's a phenomenal name. How's it going? It's going very well. Uh, as I said, it's only been a year and a half that we've been in business. And um, marketing is almost taking care of itself because people know about this. And they, there's an enormous appetite for this out there. So uh, I am, I'm thrilled. I'm very proud. Is this a logical extension of the Safety Differently website? I mean, did you imagine when you started Safety Differently that it would roll into really a, a, a force for good for the world <laughs> which sounds kind of overly dramatic but I, uh, it sort of is well this is uh, I, I do think the words are way too big but no there was I, if you if you knew me better you'll probably realize that I, I rarely have a plan with anything that I do so when I started safety differently uh, the website it was more uh, of my personal blog that was the intention the original design of just putting the frustrations and the ideas out there. And you have no idea what's going to happen, but very quickly other people came along and the website grew and we saw, you know, now we're now connected with people all across the globe. And there's clearly an appetite for a shift for thinking differently about safety. So 
of course, that then became the inspiration, the fuel to see these things coming together in stories and practices out there. What started the process of you allowing other people to be on your own personal blog? When did Safety Differently go from from Daniel's thinking to really a community of thought? Thomas Kuhn, if you know anything about Thomas Kuhn, so I like science, so I love Thomas Kuhn. Thomas Kuhn calls it the Invisible College. And I think Safety Differently would make Thomas Kuhn very happy because it represents that Invisible College. I have not thought about it as a, as a paradigm-shifting website, but... Uh, there's definitely a, a paradigm shift in you know, going from my personal outlet to, to a collaborative platform for sharing ideas. Um, and I have to uh, put the responsibility for that on my colleague at the time, Zinta Satins, uh, who sat next to me. And she's written on the website a number of times. So we were sitting uh, next to each other in an office, and I asked her. So I was telling her on the, about the website, and, and you know, she was supporting me through the initial creation of it. And then I said, do you want to share something? So she put her thoughts up there. And then I invited another friend, colleague, to write something as well. So, and that it's just snowballed out of that. And I think we've had more than 30 uh, authors writing on this since we started, which is uh, fantastic. I'm still waiting for your contribution, by the way. And my podcast is on there. How much? Is okay, I'll write something, I promise. It's, it's, uh, you all heard it. I just committed. But it is paradigm shifting. I mean, if you think about it, the art of work is sort of the open community. Uh, no, the Safety Differently website is kind of that open community of thought. And out of that comes art of work, which is actually an applied way to take this this open community of thought and, and really move it into where it can make a difference with real workers in real work. I mean, you have to feel proud about that. It has to be exciting to you at some level. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah, no, it, it, it's amazing to see where we are now. You know, we're at a safety conference here in, in Auckland, and people talk about work is mad and work is done. They talk about safety too, and all these concepts are out there. If you went to a safety conference maybe five years ago, it would be about zero harm. It would be about compliance. It would be heart and minds. And I think we're starting to see a real impact on how people talk, how they practice safety, and um, who knows where it's going to go next. But, but it, it is exciting to have been uh, at the center of this storm without controlling any of it. It has just emerged from people getting together. So one of the best ways, I think, to move beyond Safety Differently web page into sort of this applied idea would be the Art of Work master classes. Is that what they're called, master classes? Yeah, we call them master classes. It's a one-day we have one which is called Safety Differently Masterclass, where we take people through the thinking. Um, how is this a contrast to traditional safety, whatever that is? So we, we first define what we want, what, what is it that we try to get away from? And as the day progresses, we define what are we going towards and how can we do that in practice? And we end up sort of saying that, you know, you're still going to do traditional safety practices like audits, investigations, risk assessments. But what you're doing is that you're using a different lens on all those activities. And then we have exercises where we help organizations to actually start doing safety differently so they can go home and start a, either a micro-experiment or a big transformation process. Who do you see going to these master classes? Who, m- m- let me ask that differently. Who's best served by actually participating in a master class? I, I see this as a really great way to build the foundation upon which change happens in the organization, but who should be a part of it? Yeah, it's um, I, I, What we've seen so far is that we've had sort of senior safety managers and business managers, so even CEOs that come along to this course, but we also have occasionally that we run these, or we can have an organization, they send five or ten people, and you get a group of people attending. And I think that is the best setup if you want change, that you send a little coalition of people who get inspired and you plan a lot of ideas in that day, and then they go home and they work together. If you're only one person coming along to this and you then go home, you might end up more frustrated than you were before you went to this master class. So I'd say it's, it's pretty much anyone who's interested in new ideas should come along, but bring some colleagues with you. Do you find the master classes... Because they're open and collective like that, are they are they 
they, they've got to be super interesting, and and they're probably pretty high value. What are the what do the people leave with at, at the end? Well, I think it might be different for different people, um, so it depends. How's that for now? That's a nice answer. No. Yeah, that's a very nice answer. I get. So, uh, of course, we we we, we uh, upskill them in a different way of thinking. In a way, we we offer a different perspective and try to challenge them. But the best feedback I get from it is that people say, "I have rekindled my passion for this profession." I was so I having I was having doubts about what I was doing as a safety professional, but now I've returned to the source, which is about working with people and helping people to do safety critical work. Uh, rather than working against people, keeping people safe, which has been the traditional approach to it. So what people live with is, is this uh, newfound passion or refound passion, which I think is, is critical to have people out there who are keen to work with people in creating great workplaces. And you offer other master classes as well, right? Yeah, yeah no, we, we are constantly developing new master classes. Uh, we have one which is what we call the appreciative investigation, so which is really learning from normal work. It's an essential part of safety too. You can even talk learning teams as a version. It's just a type of appreciative investigation. But what a lot of safety people in particular struggle with is if, if there is no event, if there is no cause, how can you learn? How can you investigate? What is there? Has there ever been a cause? That's a good question. But so, so we go through that. What do you look at? What are the type of questions you ask? Um, and um, in, in particular, they find it challenging to, to go through this notion that you can actually learn without looking at what the rule book says. You don't have to look for deficits or deviations in order to learn. You can just look at how things make sense to people, give the time, and then you can consult your rule book. But, so that's a lot of fun going through that. We train people in, in listening skills, in asking questions. What do you do with the information when you get home? And then we have one master class which we call Enabling Leadership, which is really applying the safety different principles to leadership. In a traditional safety approach, um, the leader is supposed to be the, you know, you have the strong and visible leadership, draw the line in the sand, tell right from wrong, hold people accountable. I was saying, if complexity is the enemy, that is not a good approach. Then you need a leader who can ask questions, who can host a conversation, who has curiosity and creativity. So it's a very um, challenging day for leaders who want to understand that their role is not necessarily to have the answers, but to collect the intelligence that, and motivation that is distributed across an organization. So where do you see this all heading? What, what do you think Art of Work can do? Uh, what are some successes that you're dealing with right now? Well, what I find really motivating moments is we have organizations that come to us and they say, we would like to make a transformation. Can you help us? Can you work with us over the next year or so to, uh, to identify what is holding us back to become a safety differently type organization? And to be part of someone's journey uh, like that, I, I find really fascinating. So are you working with safety or are you working with change? Uh, I increasingly think that um, safety is about change uh, on a local level or, or even a global level because you have something that you're trying to change. You have a, a, a risk that you are unhappy with. You have practices that you're unhappy with or you, you just want to become better. But how do you engage people in change? Like that? And I must say, one of the organizations that we worked with, and they came to our master classes around safety differently, they said towards the end of the day, they said, hey, this is not about safety, or this is not just about safety. We're actually going to you know, transform our entire business with these principles. And I go, you're absolutely right. It's not just about safety. All these principles that have informed safety differently, they're very applicable to any business. It's taken from generic theories like you know, system theory or complexity theory. So it's inspiring to see people taking things on board and processing it and turning it into their own thing. And that inspiration is really, I mean, that's pretty powerful. I mean, it's clearly what you're trying to tap into. It's, it's what the art of work wants to do. How are you building capacity at your level? How are you thinking new thoughts and finding new people and creating new little Daniels, I mean, I, I don't really mean, you don't have to go into that part. I mean, I get that. But I know how that happens. But, but how, are you, how are you going to build sustainability beyond 
just the cadre of people that, for instance, listen to this podcast? I think that is a challenge that uh, we've thought about since we started and we realized very quickly that that is going to be our biggest challenge in, in backfilling the organization with people who are um, not only aware of what the, what the content is, but also able to deliver it in a convincing way and stand in front of a board and talk about these principles. It takes a little while to get to that point. So we're now setting up um, a program where we want people to come, come through our organization, do sort of shadow me and other people in the way we do work, and then we can second them to organization and coach them and sort of grow um, our own uh, employees uh, to the extent that we can't find them out in the world. But, of course, it's open for a lot of people to, to come on board. There's plenty of people out there still who are knowledgeable and able in this um, in this perspective, so you know, if you can uh, connect with them and, and get them to join us, that's a great advantage to start. How do you build that same capacity in the organizations you're helping? I mean, because really, you want that same thing for the, the you want to leave that behind as you guys move beyond, right? In the organization, you want the organization to have the ability to sustain these ideas themselves. How do you develop it internally? Yeah. So, in in two ways. Well. First, we've noticed when, once an organization starts this transformation process, they very quickly realize that they need a different skill set in their organization. So they, can you help us find a safety manager or a safety advisor who is sort of aligned with this approach? And, of course, we tap into our networks of students who have you know, studied uh, these uh, ideas before. So we try to help them to, to recruit. But we also set up coaching programs where we say, well, if you can define together with us what it is that you want to achieve we're happy to come into your organization coach these people on site we can also bring them to other clients who've come further in their uh in their experience of exploring this perspective and we can um, get them to host these people for for a limited time and sort of have that sort of cross-pollination of experiences between organizations will you keep doing safety differently i hope so I, I refuse to believe that we have cracked the code for the ultimate thing of, of safety. We've sort of solved it in 2017. Uh, I hope that 2018 I will contradict myself uh, as to what I'm saying now. That would be a, an awesome outcome of what we're doing. And finally, we're in the Sky City Tower above Auckland in New Zealand. Do you want to be the first person to bungee jump next, or would you like to be the second person to bungee jump off this tower? Are, are you going on the bungee jump line before me? I will go if you will go. <laughs> but I won't go first because then I'm afraid you won't go, so you need to go first, so then I'll go. Well, I'll, I think I'll go first. Then. Final words, anything you want to say about anything? How can they find Art of Work? Uh, the best uh, place to go to is our website, autowork.solutions. You can also find our uh, company page on LinkedIn and um, sign up for our newsletter and uh, oh, come visit us in our office in Brisbane. Thanks, Daniel. This was fun. Thanks, Todd. And that, my friends, is the conversation from the Sky City Tower in Auckland, New Zealand with uh, Daniel Hummerdahl and around the notion of art of work. Thanks for hanging out with us. It was so sweet to have you here today. I mean that. That was a really good thing. You are good people. See what I mean? Good, 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 good people. I can't even wait. There's a bunch of cool stuff coming up with the podcast, that's for sure. If you haven't had the chance to pick up your copy of Workplace Fatalities, I'm starting to get a lot of feedback. I got a really, really, really nice letter from the Steelworkers Union um, thanking me for actually taking the time to write that book i'm I'm not sure that book is that i don't know i mean all humility aside i just think it's a different way to think about catastrophic failure and fatality and the steelworkers said you know at least in their world it made a lot of sense and resonated much better than the classic sort of failure to prevent um we get really into that failure to prevent modality and then we do these really aggressive investigations on how we failed to prevent. Yeah, you, you ought to pick it up. It's available any place you buy a book. It's called Workplace Fatalities. I'm sure it's got another name because I always put a colon and a bunch of other names. But uh, pick it up. If you haven't had it, pick it up. I think you'll like it. Until then, my friends, thanks for giving me your time today for sure. I hope you get what you need. That's really good. You do not stink. Okay, let's just get that out in the open right now. You are not stinky. Um, I hope you learn something new every single day. Have as much fun as you possibly can. 
And for goodness sakes, you guys, be safe. <laughs>